and swing. Okay. Okay, Helen, would you okay. like to go? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, morning everyone, um, and thank you to Pink Link for asking me to do this, what they call the masterclass, um, I would call it a workshop. Um, I've called it Let Food Be Your Medicine, How to Survive Lockdown by Eating Yourself Fit. Um, I've got loads of information I want to share with you. I might not be able to get through it all, um, if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, I will be there to help as many people as I possibly can during this very strange time of the, uh, that the world and, and ourselves are going through. I'm going to share my screen um, now, so hopefully this will work and uh, we'll, see how, we'll see how it goes. So um, just give me one moment. And... Um, we go. Okay, so let food be your medicine, how to survive lockdown by eating yourself fit. I'll just give you a little bit of information about me. Um, I have a master's degree in nutritional medicine. I run um, a nutrition clinic at Ribby Hall Spa and also do some consultancy work um, for people with eating disorders. Um, I'm also um, a personal trainer and have 30 years yoga, te uh, yoga practice and, and teaching experience. So I run a company called Hero Lifestyle and I tend to encompass uh, the nutritional, which is functional nutrition, functional medicine, um, and give people bespoke advice on nutrition and fitness and yoga, helping them with a whole host of conditions. So I always bring in nutrition, fitness and yoga because I think the three go really, really well together. If we have a little look at today's workshop format, I will go off piece, I do tend to, but just do a bit of a sort of introduction. We are running a little bit late, but I don't think we've got anything massively, um, anywhere massively to go to um, today. So um, we're gonna have a little look, particularly at stress and the signs and symptoms of stress and how your diet um, can have an effect and the health issues that you might be associated with stress. And that's all well and good talking about what happens when you're stressed. But also what I want to try and do today is to give you some ideas to support you using nutrition to perhaps help you control the symptoms to improve your well-being and your wellness. And then also have a look at things like anxiety and sleeplessness. And that very often, that feeling we get of being overwhelmed. And then afterwards, I am available after the workshop to discuss any personal issues confidentially that people, people may have. Um, I can't give a medical diagnosis. I, I might have a master's degree in nutritional medicine, but I'm not a medical doctor, but I am a nutritionist, as it says. So if we have a look at what I want to focus on today, um, I've really done this workshop really looking at what some of my private clients have been discussing with me and I want it to be quite, quite client led because it's about you rather than about me. So please feel free to ask questions and I will do my best to answer them and like I've said earlier, if I don't know the answer I admit it and I'll try and find out for you and get back to you. Um, and also what I want you to try and do is just take a minute now to, if you've got a pen and paper, to write down some of the, the goals that you want to achieve by coming on to this workshop with regards to tackling your stress. And we can hopefully revisit them and see if you can um, address those goals by what I'm going to hopefully share with you today. So if you just write down two or three goals that you, that you might want to achieve. 
So the objectives of, of my um, presentation today are to, to be able to understand the body's response to stress, the, the physiological response to stress, and how it can affect us nutritionally. And then for maybe if you'll be able to describe the signs and symptoms of the stress response and how it can be linked with, with our diet. And as a nutritionist um, and a, a, a fitness person um, and someone who deals with yoga, I'm, I'm very much into the, the mind and the body being, being part, one great big machine and how what we put into our bodies as fuel can have a massive profound effect on how we feel. And then obviously looking at what tools can be used every day to help to control the issues we may be facing, using food as a medicine, as well as looking at some mind and body, body exercise. We're living in really strange times and it's like, I feel it's like being in a movie, only it's not, it's real life. And the stress of the situation is affecting us all in many, many different ways. But our body's response to stress physiologically is the same as it's always been. And with regards to nutrition and the nutrition aspect, many people will find they become perhaps emotional eaters. And I will address some of that afterwards. And maybe um, some of those who normally eat healthily may be turning to high calorie sugary snacks as an energy boost. But as I'll we'll just see, as I'll explain, that can have a detrimental effect longer term on, on our bodies and our minds. And I want you to just for a moment um, go back, and this is me showing my age here. I want you to um, remember the Flintstones, Wilma Flintstone and Fred Flintstone. And I want you to just imagine that you're, that you're Wilma Flintstone and imagine that you're in your cave and you're going about your daily life. And suddenly along comes a saber-toothed tiger. And Fred is somewhere doing whatever Fred Flintstone used to do. And Wilma is wanting to fight or fly from this saber-toothed tiger. So your response kicks in, your fight or flight response kicks in. And that makes your body physiologically start to change in preparation to running away from this saber-toothed tiger. Your heart rate increases your blood pressure increases, your blood starts to flow around your body quicker so that nutrients can get to your muscles in order to let your muscles work for you to run. Your pupils dilate so that your vision is much better and your energy will move from the digestive process to your muscles. And that is where your stress response kicks in. You leg it from the saber-toothed tiger, it goes away and Wilma goes back to prepare prepping Fred's dinner. So that's the stress response of the Flintstones, the caveman or woman. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, we now have that response possibly constantly. So we tend to be in a constant state of stress with a high blood pressure, high heart rates, and the body is ready in fight or flight. The muscles are always possibly tense. And at this moment in time, we're tending to have some quite profound stresses that we might not even think about. Possibly your tiger is financial worries. I know it can be mine. Job security, health scares, relationships. And that chronic effect of stress is what Wilma Flintstone had, but we're having it all the time. And when it stays switched on, the stress stops being a transient, powerful and protective force, which is what we need when we're running away from something. And it can become very debilitating and destructive. And I just want to share with you um, some information on a diagram that I've, that I've done with regards to the vicious cycle of stress and sugar overload, which is what we tend to go for when we are wanting a bit of a boost with, with regards to, to our own our energy. So at the top, where we start taking in some carbohydrates regarding digestion. So there we go, we start eating. And very often we don't maybe chew our food properly. 
we, we don't think about it. And I'll talk a little bit about mindful eating as well, hopefully at the end. Carbohydrates. The digestion of carbohydrates actually starts in the mouth when we chew our food. The saliva contains an enzyme called salivary amylase. And that, when we chew our food, can then break down the carbohydrates in order to prepare for the um, enzymes in the stomach to, to digest them more, more beneficially. So when we take in carbohydrates, the sugar in the bloodstream goes high and we start, we feel a little bit of a high for a moment in time or for a, a period of time. So we take in some chocolate or some um, bread or some sweeties and things like that. And then during this time, insulin is released by the pancreas and insulin um, is released to maintain blood sugar levels because if we have spikes, it's not beneficial. There are many, many different things which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today. So on the release of insulin, the blood sugar drops and that's when we start feeling a little bit little lethargic and that often happens after eating. So we have this intake of carbohydrates, insulin kicks in and the blood sugar drops. When that happens, the adrenal glands then start releasing adrenaline to help release the stored sugar. And if we've got overworked adrenal glands, when we are in a constant state of chronic stress, which is possibly what happens and is happening um, at, at the moment in time and prior to lockdown, then irritability, fatigue, tiredness and sleepness comes in. So then what we do is we think, oh, flipping that, I feel a bit lethargic and sleepy and tired. I think I'll grab a coffee and actually I'll have some chocolate and a biscuit with that coffee and have a coffee, have some sugar and lo and behold, we start getting a little bit of a high, which then starts here back to this vicious circle. In between that, because we are possibly having more coffee, that acts as a stimulant. So we maybe not sleep as well because it is a stimulant, but also because we are possibly under a stressful situation, we might also have what we call here, this little bit here, a load of bad gut bacteria that can have um, an effect by having a poor diet, something called leaky gut syndrome, which I'm going to jump to in the next slide. That can lead to things like bloating, digestive upset, and abdominal pain, weight gain, um, skin conditions, all sorts of things, basically just because we're not possibly addressing the stress in our diet. So if we have a little look um, at this leaky gut syndrome, one of the key areas that stress causes is abdominal and gut problems, as less time is spent on the digestive process. There's quite a lot of research, and this has been shown to be quite a profound link with healthy gut bacteria and the brain. And there's a, there's a happy hormone called serotonin, and that's been shown to have a good um, amount of link with, if you have good bacteria in your gut, that has a, a good link with the amount of serotonin that you are producing in your brain. So there is definitely a gut brain connection. So if we have a look at leaky gut syndrome, if you think, look at this little diagram, you've got your blood capillaries here, and these cells here are where um, they are lining the, the gut the, after the, the small intestine. And these little finger-like projections here are called villi, and they help with the digestion of the time food particles once we have digested. So if you think, first of all, you're not, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you think, first of all, you're not chewing your food initially, so you're getting bigger chunks of undigested food particles going into your stomach. Then you're under stress and then you, um, your body is not digesting food properly. And then you've also got a bad diet or a diet that's not good for your particular physiology. You can have undigested food particles going through into the bloodstream that then can start causing um, things like bloating, flatulence, diarrhea, constipation, and very often, if you can move away and look at your diet and look at the way you are eating and take some optimal 
nutrients to help you that can have a really good effect on helping to heal a leaky gut so your gut could be having an impact on your health and you may have symptoms of leaky gut syndrome so what as a nutritionist i work with clients doing is i look at something called the four hour approach remove replace re-inoculate and repair so we try and remove what problems there are and that's where other factors come in like fitness and like yoga and like mindfulness so we remove the stresses or we'll try to we remove the problems that have been caused with the diet and we also remove any outside influences so i encourage people to um, chew their food properly maybe take some digestive enzymes remove foods from their diet that might be causing the problem and then we replace them and we take things like digestive enzymes um, and foods that can help with the digestive process. Also chewing the food properly. We then look at re-inoculating and using beneficial bacteria. If you've been on any sort of antibiotics for um, a, a period of time, you'll, they will wipe out your good bacteria and it's really important to re-inoculate and get really good bacteria into your system. And Actimel is okay, but not strong enough. If you've been on antibiotics, you really will need some good probiotics. And then we look at repairing um, the gut by removing irritants, like I've said previously, as well as having adding herbs such as things like slippery elm and an amino acid called glutamine. So you can also add in something called prebiotics and those are foods that help feed the bacteria. So probiotics are beneficial bacteria and prebiotics are foods that you can take in that give a good, um, a good area for the bacteria beneficial bacteria to work from. So things like oats and avocados and seeds can be really good. So I want to look at things that I tend to do and I, will, I have got recipes and things which I, which I can share with you um, from today's um, presentation. But I look at things that what I tend to do and my, my lifestyle and my diet is pretty simple keeping it simple and beige food beige is out so any food that's beige in color i know fruit sweet is a brightly colored but any food that is beige in color is not really um, a beneficial food so by keeping it simple eating a rainbow um, of various brightly colored foods and centering your diet about around plant-based whole foods and there's loads and loads of, um, it's in vogue at the moment of a plant-based diet. And I am, that's absolutely fine. If people want to eat a plant-based diet, it's really healthy. And there's lots of research to show that the plant-based diet can have um, effects on re reducing heart disease and, and cancer. But try and think of just having a brightly coloured diet. So eating brightly coloured foods and by eating a rainbow, you will get all your different vitamins and minerals, um, your, your antioxidants and, and things like that. And then things like the seeds and the nuts on the lower left hand side of the slide, they um, can provide you with the prebiotics, as I said. Fill your plate with a wide variety of brightly coloured fruit and veg. Try at least um, 10 different vegetables of your meal every week. Diversity is a healthy gut microbiome and also good hormonal and emotional health. Leafy greens and dark coloured berries are particularly beneficial. So people say to me, well, what do you do? So in the morning I have muesli for breakfast I make my own muesli again I will provide a recipe um, I, I have a muesli that I use organic oats I chuck loads of stuff in seeds berries um, oats linseed maca powder um, cranberries I chop up some prunes sometimes loads of different nuts put it in a box shake it all up um, and then I have a couple of dessert spoons three dessert spoons of that with full fat natural yogurt and then berries, so um, blueberries, raspberries, um, and blackberries 
on that and that keeps me really sustained. Also try and have things like um, beans and lentils, things like chickpeas and make hummus. That's a fantastic source of fibre and protein. And again, I have a hummus recipe if you're interested. Um, and again, if you do consume um, suffer from bloating, you might need to address taking too many um, seeds and beans in initially. You can actually sort of um, build yourself up. And I would say to people, and the way I work with my clients as well, is educate yourself about the fuel you put into your body and think of them as nutrients, as, as the nutrients as powerful medicines for your body and really think about what you are putting into your body with regards to, I always say people spend more time worrying about the fuel that they put in their car than what the fuel they're putting into themselves. And it can have a really important and profound effect on, on your well-being. Another thing I am really into is hydration. I've just been seeing a private client earlier and was talking to them about what colour is your pee. And I think a couple of people who came on to my workshop in January, we talked about this. And the urine colour chart here is a really good indication of how hydrated you are. And if you're looking at what colour your pee is, ideally it should be one, two, three is a little bit dehydrated. I try and drink as much water as I can. I start my day in the morning and someone before we started the, the um, webinar um, said that they were having hot water and lemon juice, which is fabulous. And again, it's not about taking down, necking down pints of water, you know, oh, I haven't drunk. Try and sip the water throughout the day. If you are working from home, which loads of people are now, and we are um, desk based, just keep a glass of water by, by your, your side and just keep sipping it. I always start my day with um, a cup of hot water and lemon and lime slices. Sometimes I put slices of ginger in, which are really fresh ginger, which are really good. Um, it's really good anti-inflammatory as well as a, a good a good for digestion. And basically, if you can start your day with one cup of hot or cold, it doesn't have to be hot water, then you can start sort of thinking, right, that's my 250, and then just sip it throughout the day. And you'll find again, if you don't drink enough water, you might, your skin might lose its plumpness, you might get head, headaches, a lack of clarity. Um, and also you might be more prone to you in the retracting infections, particularly as, as we get older, the acidity in our vagina changes. And so maintaining hydration may help with that. So hydration is, is really, really important. Um, so like I said, sip water throughout the day. On waking, maybe try and sip a glass as you um, prepare for your day. Caffeine, try and reduce that as it is a diuretic which makes you pee more. And again, we put sometimes maybe because we're at home, it's easier to keep um, making that coffee but if you can maybe just reduce it to a couple of cups a day and maybe drink things like um, herbal teas they are marmite you either love them or you hate them um, and you, some people just don't want them but again it's it's each to their own and try and if you can look at drinking more fluid generally avoid things like cordials and fizzy drinks because that like like I said at the beginning, is part of the carbohydrate. The body can only use glucose and the brain can only use glucose. So we do need glucose. Um, it's not a don't eat any carbs um, at all, but it's the sort of carbs that you are eating and glucose and caffeine and fizzy drinks um, tend to be um, problematic. So if we have a little think about that, and then next... I always talk about this. Think about your poo. If you need to go, go. Don't hold on, as that can have a massive impact on bowel function. And if we have a look at um, your stool chart on the side, I did this one because it's uh, it, it's more easy than the, 
crystal still on the chart that the medics tend to look at. This is an amended version. Lots and lots of people are constipated and it's something that we Brits don't talk about. And it's really important that you have good bowel habits. And when I say good, I mean regular. And regular is not necessarily every day. It depends on your transit time. And it's not the number of times you go, it's how easy it is to go. Going for a poo should be as easy as going for a wee. You shouldn't strain. And if you are constipated, check what medications you're taking, increase your hydration, and maybe looking at your diet. I've just been working with a nutrition client who we basically just cleaned up her diet and reduced the amount of um, junk food that she was eating, added in some really good probiotics and prebiotics, and she's had a massive, massive change to how she feels generally. Um, and she she's she's doing really, really well. And yeah, she will go, she will go back and, and have a little blip, but she now is educating herself onto what she can and can't do for her body to, to maintain optimal wellness. So in order to achieve your healthier poo, and the ideal poo is uh, number four, like a ripple bar. In order to help achieve healthier poo, drink more fluid, eat more soluble fiber foods, such as oats, apples, avocados, strawberries, bananas, melons, and grapes. Um, three times a day or three times a week may be normal for you. Don't strain. And most importantly, if you need to go, go. As an ex-school teacher, and I know there are a couple of school teachers perhaps on here now, you will know that the girls' toilets, they're just a no-go no -go zone at school. People do not go to the toilets in school. And that can have a massive effect. If you get the urge to go and you don't go, and maybe one of the best, best, best things of happening and working from home and being um, confined to our house is you don't feel, oh, I can't go to the work toilet or whatever. It's really important that you do not, um, not go. Exercises such as things like yoga, twisting and stretching, and just moving can help improve your bowel movement. Um, and I will be doing some, some a little bit of work stretching and things with you um, afterwards. So we've looked at hydration, we've looked at constipation. Let's have a look at weight management and emotional eating. Uh, an Oxford University study has found that moderate obesity can reduce life expectancy by three years and a severe BMI of 30 and above can reduce life expectancy by 10 years and is equivalent to lifelong smoking. But I'm not just talking here about society's obsession now with how we look or the statistics that I've just said that show that being underactive or overweight can have an effect on our long-term health. But during the times that we're living in, issues with eating disorders may rise up in individuals. People may panic that foods aren't available, and they get a feeling of helplessness when their safe foods are not on the supermarket shelf. And I'm sure, and I've spoken to a couple of people who I know this week, Emotional eating has come into um, the forefront where we grab for high carbohydrates foods. And then as we saw earlier in the slide, we feel dreadful, not, sick, not just physiologically, but psychologically. So then you beat yourselves up, vow that you're never going to do it again. And then tomorrow you start again. But there are ways in which you can be helped. With regards to the stress side and the emotional eating, um, if you are an emotional eater, you can do little things to make sure or try to help yourself by planning what you're going to be doing with your day. So and things like reducing the portion sizes that you might have. And if you are going to grab for um, the carbohydrates, think about um, you know having some but, but trying to just moderate it's easy for me to say but it's but i'm just giving you some ideas of what you might want to try try to moderate and give yourself um, 
again, what I do with people who, who I have worked with who are emotional eaters, get them to do a plan of what they're going to have for breakfast, what they're going to have for their lunch, what snacks they're going to have, and be quite rigid in that plan. And some people, I'm not saying it works for everybody, some people have found that that can be really beneficial and helpful for, for them. And something else that we can have a look at as well is portion control. Lots of people always say, oh, and I want to lose weight. And I've done this again. I did this in my menopause workshop in January. If you are wanting to lose weight, as well as eating a healthy diet, you might need to look at portion size. And also the exercise that we do. We've, we've been allowed to go out and exercise once a day now, and lots of people are doing perhaps more exercise than they were when they were commuting to and from work. So that's really good. But have a look at um, what portions you are eating. I've done a little bit of research on, on cereal, and that's a bowl of cereal that I tried to take a photograph to mimic um, the, what the bowl said on the front of the packet. And it did say serving suggestion only, which is how they get away from it. So you've got a full bowl of cereal there. And then I looked at what amount they suggested that we, we should have. And this was um, what they suggested. So one serving was 30 grams or three dessert spoons. I'm not big into calorie counting, but I am doing it for, for this purpose. So I replicated the image on the box and then I actually looked at the actual portion size recommended. And three dessert spoons is about 114 calories. Now I know most people wouldn't measure out um, three dessert spoons, they just pour it in the bowl. And I would say um, that big bowl that I measured at the beginning, I think that was about seven portions. No one possibly would eat seven portions, but maybe probably between three and five portions. So that's already between 340 odd and 570 calories. And then people become really virtuous because they use skimmed milk. So if you look at the calories for a man and a woman, a woman particularly is 2000 calories. So that would be over a third of your daily intake. So it's no problem if the rest of your diet is smaller portions or you have a very active lifestyle, but most people do tend to have much bigger portions than, than what we need and what we actually require for our energy and consumption on a daily basis. And so that is how weight tends to creep on. And if we look at how portions have increased since the 1950s, we have perhaps increased as a, as a race, definitely. And that just gives you a little idea of how um, we, our portions have increased, but our, our daily energy intake hasn't. If you ever want to watch a really good documentary, Super Size Me is quite good fun to watch, where he goes through all the McDonald's um, in New York City and has to supersize on them. And it just, it's just amazing. Uh, he was told, the guy who did it, I can't remember his name, he's a, a documentary and his wife or girlfriend was a chef, a vegan chef. And he had all his blood done at the beginning of the documentary. And very soon into the documentary, he, um, he was told to stop because they tested his blood, looked at his blood levels and said, right, you're gonna have to stop this. So if we start now having a little look at I do a lot of stuff with mindfulness when eating and drinking and working with clients with nutritional concerns, be it weight issues, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, colitis, constipation, stress. One thing we could all benefit from is being more mindful about what and when we are eating. And when you think about being mindful when you eat, it's really, actually being mindful about what you are doing for the here and now and that's where yoga comes in we tend to eat whilst we're multitasking and i think possibly as women we do that more more regularly so we're rushing around working from home trying to sort children out looking at our mobile devices, sorting their breakfast out and grabbing something and then not actually remembering what you've eaten. 
So appreciate things like the colour of your food, how it's arranged on your plate, what the different nutrients are that are fueling your body from the meal that you're eating. And also, if it has meat or fish in it, just being grateful. This is nothing to do with religion, but just being grateful to the animal for its donation to you. Maybe thinking about the vegetables and the crops, the way they've been grown and harvested, who's cooked the meal. Thinking about the taste and the texture and the flavours of the food. And a really good mindful eating exercise is and I did this with a little course that we were doing, is just getting a really small item of food, things like a mini egg or a satsuma is a, a really good thing to, to try it with. And basically hold it in your hand before you eat it and look at it and think about it and smell it. Think about the colours and the flavours. And if you do that, you will start the digestive process going before you've even eaten the food and your salivary glands will start to um, make your mouth water and that is a really good way of starting the digestion process and then you can start eating the food and chewing it and that again has a really good effect with how um, your digestive process um, starts to work going back to the very slight beginning or one of the first slides at the beginning when we talked about in, um, leaky gut syndrome and undigested food particles. So mindfulness when you eat and drink is, is possibly a really good little exercise that you can do. And we, you know, we, we're all being told to be more mindful at the moment and looking at nature and doing all sorts of things. Um, but mindful eating is a really, really good exercise. Something you could even, if you have children, you could even try and um, do a little game with the children about mindful, mindful eating and mindfulness. And so if we move on now, I want to start doing a little bit of um, restorative, restorative um, yoga. We're not going to do any exercises per se, as in moving around, but I want to talk to you about yoga and breath. So on from mindful eating, I wanted to share with you some mindful breathing techniques. And in yoga, we call this pranayama. And pranayama is basically control of the breath, making you aware of the breath that we generally take for granted every day. And if you do have a more of awareness of your breath and of what you eat, that can have a profound effect on both physiology and psychology. Every Thursday evening, I'm running a candlelit um, virtual meditation class. Um, and we do a lot of breathing work and we do a lot of visualization and everybody gets very relaxed but also I'm, I'm teaching people um, how to breathe properly and the daily pranayama practice can train your lungs to improve their capacity and so improve the oxygen to vital organs. It can also work as a meditative and stress releasing practice as by focusing on the breathing and the function of your breath other elements are, momentum, are, are momentarily put to one side. So there are lots of different breathing techniques, but diaphragmatic breathing can improve your thoracic cavity. Alternate nostril breathing can regulate your balance, um, breathing through your nose. Walking meditations. We're all encouraged to go out for a walk or a run. And what I've been doing, and that this has got nothing to do with nutrition, I wanted to share this with you before we do the breathing practice. I go out regularly for a, a run um, with my little dog, and I've been going in the morning and going for a run, and it's beautiful, go quite early, you don't see anybody, and I've been doing it for years. But over the past um, three weeks since lockdown and since things have changed um, dramatically, I've been going out for a run, and then my mind starts mind traffic 
and I start thinking about oh, what's going to happen with my business and how is it going to work and you know um, I can't get any money from the government because my business is only just a year old and I don't rent the premises all this stuff that's all my issues nobody else's but they are in my head and lots of other people will be having all those issues so I then get back from a run which is supposed to make me feel really good and I'll have all this mind traffic so what I've been doing, and it's worked really well for me, and I've shared it with a couple of other people, and they've started doing it. I've been going out for a run, and I've been counting nature. And so as I go out for a run, I, I see flowers. I don't always know what they're called, but pretty blue flowers. I think they're forget-me-nots. Things like daffodils. And then I start counting um, nature and looking at birds and what have you. And so now when I go out for a run, I'm actually looking more for things I can see. Hopefully I won't fall over and trip off. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to share that with you because that's been really, really helpful for me. And so this is what this workshop's all about, not just about nutrition, but about the whole holistic approach, which I hope I'm sharing. So if we um, move on from there, I did go off piece just like I said I did at Brownwood at the beginning. I want to just share a couple of um, breathing practices with you that you will be able to will be able to use, and just a very gentle meditation with you. So if you get yourself really comfortable, you can sit or lie down, and just close your eyes and just empty your mind of anything. If you have a to-do list, which we all have, just take that to-do list and put it to one side. If you have mind traffic that keeps coming in, just let it float by. Don't beat yourself up, just let it float by like little clouds, but just try and focus on my voice and try and focus on my, my words. So if you just start thinking about your breath, and your miracle of breath that we just take for granted every day. And focus on your breath going up through your nostrils, down into the back of your throat and into the lungs, taking vital oxygen and nutrients to your heart and through your circulation. You might want to visualise it as a colour. It can be any colour, but whatever colour pops into your head. And then visualise that blood coming back through the heart, through the lungs, up through the back of your throat, down through your nose, and feel the warm air on your top lip. And just inhale again, up through your nose, down the back of your throat, through your lungs, into your heart. Visualize that oxygen and nutrients circling around your body. Then coming back through your heart, through your lungs, up through the back of your throat, and that warmer air touching the top of your lip. I'd like to int introduce you now to placing one hand on your heart centre and one hand on your abdomen. And we're going to do some deeper counting breaths. Because very often, particularly in stressful situations, we take very shallow breaths. And we breathe just using the top part of our lungs, whereas we have a whole lung capacity that we tend not to use. And we're going to do some counting breaths. And I'm going to count up to four, and then we'll acknowledge the pause at the top of our breath, and then we'll count back down. So we're going to inhale, one, two, three, four. Just acknowledge that pause at the top of your breath. And then exhale, one, two, three, four. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Acknowledge that pause at the top of your breath. And exhale, one, two, three, four. Inhale for five, one, two, three, four, five, and just acknowledge that pause and just visualize and feel that your ribs and your abdomen have expanded. And then exhale, pushing your belly button back, two, three, four, 
five. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Acknowledge that pause at the top of your breath. And exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Just acknowledge that pause at the top of your breath. And exhale, one, two, three, four, five. And just keep counting your breaths up for one to five, holding and then releasing them to five. And you'll find if you are in an anxious state, feeling a little bit panicky, you've had an email that makes your heart race a little bit, I've been there, I know what it's like. Just taking a moment just to start counting your breaths and saying, I am counting and inhaling. Acknowledging the cause, I am exhaling. And that can just help. It doesn't make the problem go away, but it can help you handle the problem. And in the meditations that I've been doing um, on Thursday evenings, I've also been trying to find positivity in what we have and what we have not. And it's not necessarily, we, we have no control over the situation that we're in at the moment. And that for lots of people who are control freaks can be quite difficult. So rather than panicking because you have no control, Think about what you do have control over. So you still have control over the emotions and how you respond to the situation. And also this basic gratitude. As you are meditating, relaxing with your breath, think about three things that you can still do. Three things that you still have. I still have hot running water. I can still go out for a run. I still have food on my table. So lots of really simple things. I can still get out of bed in the morning. Really simple things that make you realize what you still have and what you can still do. So if you gently open your eyes now and maybe just come back to um, the here and now, and hopefully that's um, helped you feel a little bit more relaxed or at least given you the tools that you can practice to help you. If we just have a little summary of some tools and coping strategies. So tools and coping strategies that I tend to do is keep it simple, eat the rainbow and the alphabet, do something you love daily, maybe get outside with nature, um, go back to your inner child, plan, try and plan what you're going to do for your day. If you are an emotional eater, or you have nutritional concerns and problems, plan what your diet is going to be, plan your meals, um, try and do in advance. And again, people go, oh, well, it's, it's hard, uh, the shops, you can't get online shopping or what have you. My shopping hasn't changed. I let everybody go and do all the bulk buying or whatever, and I didn't go shopping for about 10 days. I think we, we ended up with beans and eggs or something that we had for the last meal then we ended up I ended up going and for the past three or four shops I've been once every eight or nine days and I've managed to buy everything um, in quite a serene way from Aldi there are other stores available ask for help if you need help there are lots of lots of people out there I am providing um, 20 minutes um, consultations for people if they want nutritional advice um, or fitness advice. If people want to email me or phone me um, after after this, um, I have got a yoga, an online yoga class at half past twelve and a couple of other things going on today. But I will, if people do want to, I will get back to them, and um, that's that's no problem. Um, try and stick to a routine, both nutritionally. And, um, and physiologically and psychologically. And don't restrict yourselves completely, but be realistic. Spoken a little bit about portion control. 
and then exercises for the mind and body. I did a little video on LinkedIn um, for desk, desk exercises. Um, but also, we, you can do hip work at home, CV work. I know there's um, another lady who said she ran a, a gym in Poulton um, and she's doing some, um, some classes, which is fantastic. You can, uh, Zoom is brilliant. I'm doing quite a lot of live classes um, for, for hip and CV work, um, just body work, yoga for flexibility and strength. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say Om Shanti, which means may peace be with you. Um, I've got my details here and um, if anybody wants to take them, if you want to speak with me confidentially about any nutrition related issues that I've raised today, or um, fitness, etc., then um, please feel free to, to contact me. Um, and thank you for listening. I hope it's been of benefit to you. I always think you always learn one thing when you go on to a, a workshop or something. So hopefully you've learned one little thing. And thank you and Om Shanti. Helen, I'll just end your slideshow for you. Okay, shall I stop the share? Yeah, do you want to stop the share so we can just see everybody's faces again? Hey, how are we all doing, ladies? Uh, let me unmute you all. There you are, you're all unmuted. How are we all doing? Oh, good, that was excellent. Good. That's really good. Picked up some really good tips there, yeah. um, Helen, especially about the preparing a bit more on the old shopping list and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a few questions. There's been some questions on chat. Um, so let's have a little see if I can. I'll try my best to answer them. And if I can't, I'll, I'll find out. Well, I'll have a look at it, but I can see who you. <laughs> okay. um, right. So, same as you. What, what's the best breathing practice when you can't breathe through your nose? Oh, I'm broken. Broken nose. Wow. Okay. Best breathing practice, if you can't breathe through your nose, you can still try and inhale and hold and exhale. And it's all about holding that breathing rather than going, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, ex, as an ex teacher, um, when, when um, I, you used to get, if girls in secondary schools, the, the classic one is their boyfriends just dumped them and gone off with their best friend. So they're there in your classroom going, <gasps> and it's <don't> me. <laughs> and so to get them to breathe, but then they've got a really snotty nose, yeah? So you just say, right, just, so again, even though you might not be able to breathe through your nose and through your mouth, which is what we have, sort of that's your pranayama, you can still inhale, acknowledge that pause, and exhale. So hopefully that, that will be. Uh, um, Thank you. You should be trying to be at the, my dentist when I can't, when he's trying to do treatment. <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? I've got something for you. If, you. if the dentist trying to do treatment, I do something called rotation of the consciousness. Um, and basically I'm lying in the dentist chair and basically um, what you do is you, and I, I didn't have time to do it today, I have done it before, and I do it in a lot of, at the end of my yoga practice um, with people, I, um, um, you, you basically do a body scan and you lie in the dentist chair and you go, first finger of my, first, thumb of my right hand, first finger, second finger, third finger, and you just <laughs> keep doing that. Honestly, it helps a great deal, it really does. I'm not I, bothered with going to the dentist, it's just that he can't, he has to keep stopping so I can breathe. <laughs> right, oh right, oh okay, sorry I got that wrong. <laughs> right, ladies, can we all just uh, do a reaction and give a clap for <laughs> Helen, please? <laughs> Om Shanti, peace be with you. Hello. And as I say, if anyone wants to um, email to get, um, I've got some recipes. I'm gonna, I'll try and put them on there if I can paddle it out. <laughs> Ellen, can I just check? Did you share your details on the chat? 
Uh, yes, I did. I put I put my um, I put my email address there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so ladies, before you leave and before I end the meeting, if you want to download the file from the chat, if you just um, hit the three little buttons and you'll get them more, and you can download the chat information there, and then it'll save to your document. And then you've got the details for Helen if you'd like to get in touch. And as well, don't forget, if you've heard anything this morning that you think might be of interest to anybody of your friends or family, uh, please do pass on the details. Um, are we all good? Yep. Good. Ladies, thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Helen. Bye. Namaste. Bye. Thank you.